And, and what happens then is that this is going to maintain constant pressure. That's why I use C sub P, constant pressure, and this is the number. The, the very first thing in the problem says you've got this many moles of, so that's your N. All right? And then I, something gives me the temperature. I wish I should have written it down, but I didn't remember, but too much happened between now and then. All right, so it goes from 27 degrees to 127, right? So we know delta T is 100. Doesn't matter, Celsius or Kelvin, it's the same because it's a temperature difference. So either 100 here. So we know the moles, we know the temperature difference, we know C sub V, we can now calculate Q, right? The first step you did is finding the work, and that should have been fairly simple, right? Because work is just P delta V, and they gave you all the information to see for that. Just be sure that you put your P in pascals instead of atmospheres, and your delta V in cubic meters, right? Oh, okay, so you know that work is P delta V. And, and, and they give you the pressures one atmosphere. You have to calculate how much the volume changes in order to find this out. But they gave you everything from the ideal gas law. They tell you how many moles you have. They tell you the initial temperature is 27. We do have to put that in Kelvin. And we know the pressure. I can find the volume. Then you go to your new one. I have to convert that to Kelvin. And I can find the new volume. So I find two different volumes. And they go in here. Right? Is everybody okay with that? Don't say yes if you don't mean it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I am talking fast. So slow down a little. It's that worry I have. There's so much I want to cover. All right, but this is more important to understand at least what this is coming from. Just ideal gas law. And the problem says one atmosphere of pressure. It says the initial temperature is 27 Celsius and the final temperature is 127 Celsius. So since N and R, oh, and it's given in the problem, R is just a constant, I can then calculate V for the 27 degrees, and I can calculate it for 127. Now I know how to find delta V, which goes in here. P is just one atmosphere, so change to 1.01 times 10 to the fifth, and whatever your delta V is, now you found the work. If the volume increases, is the work done by the gas positive or negative? That, didn't, that wasn't the answer I was expecting as a unison roar. All right, listen again. If the volume of the gas increases, is the work done by the gas positive or negative? Positive. Everybody there? Because, and so therefore, is the work done by the piston positive or negative? So watch out for that. So if they're asking the gas is positive, if they're asking the work from the piston, then it's negative because they're just opposite. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know the number. Oh, it's, the it's, the, it's the very first one on the second set. All right. And then, so from that, we can find the work. Now, what they should have asked is find delta u. Or excuse, uh, excuse me, find q. They asked delta u, and, and you can't do it with this information. So you, then what they should have said is find q. And, uh, and you use this to get the q. Uh, my, And what's the law that's going to help me tie that all together? By name, first law, right? First law of thermodynamics says delta U equals Q minus W. You found W. You write it in. We're about to find Q. We're going to write it. Now, here's the deal, guys. If this is positive, Q is flowing in or out of the gas. If, if this number turns out to be positive, does that mean that Q flows in or does it flow out? If I'm increasing the temperature of a gas, I need heat to flow in. Right? So I have heat flow into the gas, and that means I've got, I get a positive Q. And you're going to get that Q from this number right here. This is the thing that you need. We don't have it in our book, that's why I'm doing this now, because it's not in your book. And I'm doing a lot of time because I want you to get it right. But as soon as you get it right and leave it, you're done because I'm not going to put on the test since you can't study from it from the book. All right. So I just want you to be able to get the right answer. You now found W. You found Q. You can find W again. Okay? And that's what that's what the problem is about. Okay. So that should help everybody get full credit on that. And like I said, I would have pulled it off the assignment, but I 
once anybody starts an assignment, I can't edit the assignment, which makes sense. Kind of. I think I should have the right to pull a problem off if I want to, but that's not one of the options. All right. Um, so, any other question on that before I erase and move on? From this specific thing. All right. So, then we're going to say that we're done with that. I just want to make sure it wasn't someone from a previous class. All right, so then um, Ramon, go, we'll go ahead and add, do you put your questions? Okay, so it was, it, we want to add ice to water and bring it to a final temperature. Guys, listen, this problem I'm going to do, I need you to follow it, and some form of this has a good chance of being on the test. It is a lot of, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to get at first, but remember, it, but it's that thing I told you, there's a million little equations that come at you like a snowstorm. But I need you to be able to synthesize that into a problem like this. So let's first just talk through the idea of this problem. I have a vessel of water that has a particular temperature. I have a bucket of ice chips. This is real life, not the problem. I have a bucket of ice chips, I've got this water. And I, the water is like 85 degrees, I don't care what it is. And I want it to be 40 degrees. I know it's going to be different in your problem. I'm just saying, here's the deal. So I've got this bucket of water, and I want to put ice chips in until I get it down to a particular temperature. So I just take the chips in, and I drop them in one by one, and stir. And do you understand that when I drop the ice chip in, if I really want to be careful not to go too low, I need to stir till that completely melts and everything comes to temperature before I put the next one in. Right? So the deal is there's three things that happen to that ice, and this is what's tricky. Three things, because the ice starts colder than zero degrees. So I drop in the ice chip and it's 10 degrees below zero. It's actually, I think, 10.1, but that doesn't matter. It's 10 degrees below zero, I drop it in. What's the first thing that happens? I have to raise the ice temperature up to zero degrees because in order to melt, it has to be zero. So how do I heat ice? How do I heat anything where the temperature changes? I gave you two equations. One is for when temperature is changing, and one is for when phase is changing. What's the equation for when temperature is changing? Mc delta T. Right, we have Mc delta T. All right, and then what's the one for when there's a phase change? Okay, so we have Q equals ML. And it's easy to see that because if the temperature is changing, I have a delta T. If the temperature is not changing, it must be a phase change. Does that make sense? So here's the thing. I don't know how many ice cubes I need. That's going to be my M. All right? So they've given me all the information I need to find out how much heat flows out of the water to get to my goal temperature. Because the water starts at a certain temperature and it drops to a certain temperature, but it stays water. This is my equation. So the Q out of the water is what's the mass of the water? And that's going to be probably different for everybody. I think it was 0.33 kilograms for me, um, right? So I, you might have a different mass here. So this is the mass of the original water. This is C for water, and there's the specific heat for water, which is 4180 or 4190. Your author switches those back and forth. Use the number that he gives you. On a test, I'll use 4180 because that's more standard. All right. But so this would be this for water, 4180. And then delta T is how much did it cool, but he gives you both of those temperatures. But when you do that, you're going to get a negative number, right? Because your final is lower than your initial. So I get a negative number. There. Does that make sense that that's a negative number? If I have something warm and I want it to get cool, do I put heat into it or do I take heat out of it? That's negative. Heat is positive when it goes in. It's negative when it comes out. Where does that heat go? It's not going to flow out just because it wants to. It's going to flow out to do something. What does it flow out to do? To heat, melt, and warm the ice. Does everybody get that? So the Q from cooling the liquid, the, the water, has got to equal the Q that melt, I mean heats, melts, and raises the temperature of the ice. So on the ice, Q is equal to the mass that I don't know times C delta T plus the mass that I don't know times the heat of fusion of, of ice plus mc 
phi delta t, and I'm intentionally making this look horrible because these all look like exactly the same thing. But although these m's are all the same, these c's are, well, these two are the same, but these two c's are different. All the delta t's are different. Do you, you follow what I'm saying here? So what is the c that I'm going to use here? What's happening in this first term? I'm eating ice. Therefore, I need the C that they give me in the problem for heating ice, which is 2100. Do you see that in your problem? So I'm going to use, I say, and then since this M is the same for everything, how I do it is this. I pull that out and I say 2100 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And Kelvin or Celsius doesn't matter because everything's delta T. All right? And what is my delta T for heating ice? Everybody has a different number. But you're going to, me, I started at negative 10. What, did, what somebody else, what do you say? Negative 14, negative 16. So whatever that is, you go from there to zero. What's delta T? Let's say, it's, say it was negative 15. So I go from negative 15 to zero. What's delta T? 15. Not negative 15, but 15. Everybody good with that? So that would be what I put here. I'll put 15, but you realize that you're all going to have a different number there. All right? So I get that, and I'm done with that. Then I add this, but this is the heat of fusion. This is the heat that you're always going to use when you're changing state, uh, phase from ice to water. So this is just a 3.34 times 10 to the fifth, um, and that's per kilogram. All right. And then on here, it's again still the mass of the ice, but I've got that factored out. And now what is it? I've melted the ice, and now what is it? Water, but at what temperature? If I take ice that's zero degrees to do this, it turns into water at? For some reason, people can think this one easy. I've got water on the stove. I'm boiling it. Okay, I start boiling it, I wait a little while later, and I'm boiling it, I wait a little while later, I'm boiling What's the temperature of this water? It's going to stay 100 Celsius the entire time. When you change phase, temperature doesn't change because there's no way for it to. There's no delta T. So when you're changing phase, there is no temperature change. You have water at zero and ice at zero. So I'm still at zero when this is done. So my delta T here goes from zero to whatever my final temperature is going to be. And what's and some of you, what are some, I don't know, you all have different, what's the final temperature, just to get an idea? 40. 40, all right. So in that case, then, because we started at zero, delta T is just 40, right? So I get plus 418, I'm going to use the 80, all right, because it's, now it's water. It melted, but it, and it's still zero, but it's water at zero. So I have the 4180 for water times the 40, which is the temperature, and... <laughs> This is all really easy to punch into a calculator and get a number. This has to equal the same number that we got from just cooling the water, except for it's positive. Right? Because it flowed out of the water and into the ice. So this total thing has to equal whatever that number was that you got from just cooling the water. All you do then is divide that number by this new number that you calculated, and that gives you your M. From everything I've seen, I've seen four different versions of this problem so far, 0. 0.0 something is what your answer is going to look like. I haven't seen anybody that had a number in the first decimal place. So your, your mass is in general going to be something like 0. 0.0 some number. All right? And that number has been anything from 0.1 to 0.4 that I've seen so far. But I haven't seen anything bigger than that. But in any case, do you see the basic way to approach that problem? What's important about this and why I say it could be on the test is it's really important to be under to be able to understand the order in which things kind of happen calculation wise in real life all of those things are happening at once because when I dump the ice in some of it's melted some of that melting part is warming and some of it's still melting all right especially if it's a big cube the outsides melt I've still got this stuff left over but from a calculational point of view we do it in the order of warm it to zero melt it and warm it to the final temperature Hey, what if instead of putting ice in this, I had actually been, I had dumped in steam at 110 degrees? So I've got water at a particular temperature, and I dump some steam in that's 110 degrees. How would the problem change? 
I would take the steam, and what's the first step I would do? I would cool it to 100. Then what would I do? I'd condense it to water, and then I would cool it from 100 degrees down to whatever my final temperature is. Right? Do you understand the process? Okay, so the steam is hotter than 100. So the first thing I do is if heat flows out of the steam, it's going to cool it, right? And it'll cool it until it hits 100. When it hits 100, it can't cool below that until it condenses to water. So the step is cool the steam to 100. Now it's steam at 100. Now I can't cool it anymore. It has to condense to water, right? So then I use the ML, and for steam, it's, it's a big, much bigger number even than the heat diffusion. It's called the heat vaporization. Again, it's a number you don't memorize. It gets given to you. And I just use that to condense the steam into water at 100. Now I cool that 100 degree water down to whatever my final temperature is. And those are the three steps we could take. By the way, if you are cooking and your boiling water and the boiling water splashes out on your arm, or you're cooking and you take the lid off the pot and steam comes out and hits your arm, they're both 100 degrees, which one burns you worse? Steam, why? Why will you always be burned far worse with steam than with water, both at the same temperature? Because it has more energy, right? Exactly, because the steam has to condense to water at 100 degrees before it starts to cool, and it's a lot of energy to change phase. So steam burns are extremely severe compared to just regular uh, a regular water burn. Steam is much, much more dangerous. All right. Okay. So they have the same temperature, but they have energy. Precisely, because in the steam is all this energy stored as a phase change. And this is why all the Navy ships that run on turbines use steam instead of water. All right. I don't know if they do this anymore. Is everything up here nowadays? Well, in the old days when I was in the Navy, uh, before nuclear was a big deal, is that all. All ships used to use steam because steam is a much more efficient way of getting energy out. It also has the added disadvantage though, but if you don't do your boilers right, they can blow. And that's also fun too. Yeah. That's a phase change. And that's when we melt the ice. So the ML is right here. All right, so look, look, look. I pulled the M out. This is the L, and that's another that we'll be given to you. All right. Any other question on that before we run away? Yes. Right. What I say, we found out what the heat was that we needed to pull out of the initial water to get it down to its final temperature. Right. So we had M C delta T. M was given. C was given. Delta T was given. So I know the amount of energy that's available, and that's what this M has to be the right number to make this whole thing equal that whole thing. I saw another hand. Yeah. Yes. Those are those are numbers that are they're just constants for a given substance, and so I, I always give you those kinds of constants. Though. Fifteen was just a number I pulled out of my hat to sort of match. Uh, let me just quickly take. I guess what what what's the part that's not working? Um, what was your what was your initial MC delta T that you used for the water coming down? In other words, how much water do you start with? You so said you got 0.345 uh, of your original mass, and then you've got 4180 times um, your 61 goes down to 29, so whatever that delta T is. Is that what you did? No. All right, so that, do you see that now? Any, any other questions before we charge ahead? All right. So, um, I have uh, another concept kind of thing I want to point out to you. And the fact that I'm taking time to point this out means it's probably a concept question. Right? Do you remember that I talked to you about the fact that in any, in any gas or liquid that has a particular temperature, the velocity distribution of the molecules of that gas or liquid are all over the place, right? In other words, they're not, even though we say 
one half m v r m s squared equals you know three half n k t. For a given temperature, not everything has the same velocity. And to, so what it typically looks like is something that looks like this. This is called a Maxwellian because Maxwell is the one who discovered it. All right, and. <clears throat> The temperature is related to the average kinetic energy. So if we take this as my DRMS, this is the velocity that's the average velocity of this whole curve. Now, faster velocities correspond to what? In a, in a gas or a liquid, the faster it's going, the higher the temperature, right? So even though there's an aggregate average, then what that tells you is that there's always going to be some things that are moving faster. So now, are you, why do we sweat? How does, how does sweating cool me down? Why does sweating cool me? When the sweat comes to my skin, the skin raises the temperature to the surface temperature of my skin. This is the distribution of the molecules in my sweat. What's happening, guys, is these are actually moving so fast they're boiling. Not very many of them, but some are moving so fast they're actually boiling and they leave. If I take all these off, what happened to my average temperature? Do I take, in other words, if you're in a class and you've got a test every single day for three weeks and you've got scores that range from 15 to 100 and the teacher says, I'm going to drop everything above 90%, what happens to your average score? It drops. So here's the thing. If you take away all the highest stuff, what happens to my average? It drops, and if my average temperature drops, what else? I mean, average. Go ahead, talk about an answer. If my average velocity drops, what else drops? Temperature, and that's what cools me. Does that make sense? I've got this entire distribution. When it's on my skin, the highest moving, the fastest moving ones are literally at the boiling point. They're going so fast that they boil away and leave, lowering the average, making me feel cooler. The line supposed to be faster. Yes. So let's so let's think about that. If I have average and this is not symmetrical, the peak would not have as much on this side as it would have on the other side due to the lack of symmetry. So it needs to be a little bit further this way to catch so that half of, half is on both sides. Thanks, I was going to actually say that. I forgot to. So yeah, it's intentional that I don't draw that line at the peak. The average velocity drops, the average velocity drops. Then the temperature drops. All right, and that's, that's true of any evaporation. And you can increase that. Like if you get a, a, a cloth wet and you swing it around in the air really rapidly and then touch it to your skin, it'll feel really cold because that swinging around uh, allows all the, uh, the, the exposure. In other words, uh, yes, when something stays in one place, it heats the air around it. If you make it swing rapidly, it's always being exposed to cooler temperatures, and so basically it gets rid of the, the highest ones faster. So you can lower the temperature substantially. I'm sorry, can you one more time why the, the line is not right? Yes. So the, I did averages. If I have an average, it means there's just as much on this side as there is on this side. So if I were to cut this out of paper and cut along this line and weigh them, the two pieces of paper would weigh the same. This, is, this would be the average of this right in the middle because it's the same on both sides. This is not the same. It tails off. So I need to come this direction a little bit to be sure I've got half on each side. I'm not too worried about that at this point, but if you were going to go on into statistical science, that's really important. I, I, I would probably at this point write nasty notes if you put it right on the peak, but I probably would take points off. Okay. All right, now that I've said that, everybody will remember, which is probably a good thing. All right. Um, okay. Now, um, in chemistry, have you talked about entropy? Somebody give me an idea of what entropy is. I don't need an equation, I just need a basic concept. What's the idea of entropy? Yeah. Randomness. Randomness, all right. So it's a lack of order, right? When things are ordered, that's the more ordered they are, the less entropy we have, and the less ordered they are, the more entropy we have. So it's kind of a, one of those weird things. Entropy is an increase in disorder, right? And yeah, guess what? That is easy to say, but in everyday life, it doesn't always make complete sense. Um, in terms of gases, what we often say is 
if you can imagine, if I had a gas in a container and I compressed and compressed and compressed and compressed the container, the more I compress it, the less options are available for the locations of the molecules, right? So that forces the gas to become ordered. As I, as I compress it, put it in a tighter and tighter spot, it forces it towards order simply because there's not as many options. So it's, it's sort of like if we were in a room where we could barely fit, there would not be as many options for locations for people as there would be if we were at a football field. Then I have lots of ways I can arrange the people in a football field. So that's an increase in disorder because there's many more ways I can arrange things within that given volume. So there is a loose connection of volume to entropy. There are things for which um, it really is hard to talk about entropy. So we, we usually come up with fairly silly ideas, but the, the basic idea remains the same. Entropy is sort of a measure of um, you can't go home again. So like if I have a glass of water and I put it on the table and I tip it over and the water splashes down to the floor, if I wait till the end of time, the molecules will never jump back off the floor and back into the cup, right? You say that, but guess what? It does not violate any of Newton's laws. Because when they went down there and hit it, they created thermal energy, and that thermal energy flowed back into them at just the right rate and speed, and it would throw them right back up into the air and back up into the cup. But there's only one way that could happen, and there's a quadrillion, billion, quintillion ways that it won't. So the chance of it ever happening is exactly zero, all right? And that's what we mean by order, is when you get something so that there's only one way it can happen, that's really, really ordered. So one of the laws that we talk about is that the entropy of the universe always increases. Sometimes something stays the same. Sometimes entropy decreases locally, but at an expense of something else. So the very fact that any of you exist is a decrease because you're highly ordered. The molecules in your body are in a very special spot doing very special things, that's highly ordered. How is it possible then for me to say that you know you being a baby and growing into who you are, how is that not a, a decrease in entropy? Because uh, I'm saying in the universe entropy always increases. Yeah? Is that every moment you do it's not there, there's that, but There's something else going on which is really important to understand here. Anytime you get a decrease in entropy locally, which is you or me, what had to happen somewhere else. An even bigger increase in entropy. And what are the things that increase entropy around me to allow me to be a, a local decrease? How much, how efficient is it to grow food on this planet? It turns out it's not 100% efficient, right? I mean, if you water and fertilize, there's always loss, it doesn't all work, to, it doesn't all come get into food. And when I eat that food, how much of it do I actually digest and get into my body? Not all of it, all right? And so what happens is, yes, all the food that I eat, all the milk you drink as a baby, all these things, there was a bigger increase in entropy for those things to get where they are. So you can have local decreases, but that means there's bigger increases somewhere else, all right? Um, so on the whole, the entropy of the universe increases, all right? Now, so that being said, one way for you to think of this is, imagine I have a penny. And if I have just one penny and I drop it and it's not rigged, if I drop it many, many, many times, what do we expect to have happen as far as heads and tails? About 50-50, right? So half the time will be heads, half the time will be tails. Now I have two pennies. What are the possible outcomes? Two heads, two tails, and head tail and tail head. Right? How many ways can I have two heads? So I have four outcomes, right? How many ways can I have heads? Two heads. One. How many ways can I have two tails? One. How many ways can I have a head and a tail? Two. two. There's more entropy in the heads and tails. So when I throw them, it's less likely that I'll get two heads or two tails than it is to get head and tail. It turns out if I now do three pennies, then there's only one way to get three heads, there's only one way to get three tails, but there's four ways to get two heads and a tail or two tails and a head. All right? And it just goes up. So it turns out that after a while, given the, the set, Getting all heads and getting all tails is never going to happen if you have a million pennies. Not in your lifetime, anyway. But there's lots of states that can happen many, many times. So you'll get them, not always the same thing, but you'll get like half of them heads, half of them tails, 
And that's a, a very likely state. Literally, if you dump a million pennies, it's going to be very close to half and half heads and tails most of the time because it's the most probable outcome. So that's another way of thinking about entropy, is whenever there's a, a lot of ways for a certain thing to occur, that's going to happen rather than the one single ordered way of things happening. So half heads and half tails is greatly disordered, and all heads is very ordered, all tails is very ordered. So that's, that's the main idea that we've got going. Um, what I'm going to do now is derive an equation that is tied to entropy and will allow you to do some of your homework. And at least also to understand what's going on. So we know from the ideal gas law that the change in the internal energy is equal to Q minus W, where Q is N to the gas and by the gas. All right? And if it's something else, like if it's on the gas, all that changes is the sign. If it's out of the gas, all that does is change the sign. Right? So there's a lot of different ways we can see this. We learn it this way, and then we can see if it's positive or negative by whether or not the gas is doing the work or whether the heat is flowing into the gas. For right now, I want to analyze an isotherm. There's two reasons for this. If I do anything other than an isotherm, I have to integrate to get my answers. So by using an isotherm, that means what stays constant? Temperature. So if I do that, that says 0 is equal to Qn minus W by, and I'm being lazy, that's into gas and by the gas. All right. Now, what I can say is from that, that tells me that Qn is equal to W. And I'm going to not write the N and, uh, and by for, just because to keep it a little tidy, but understand that they're there. All right, um, what's the work done in terms of, you know, so I thought that equals work. What is, what is work on a gas? You guys are really scary. Change the volume. It's change of volume times a pressure, right? We good at that? So this is basically this. Now, what I really should write, calculus guys, is this. I'm not going to, we're going to assume infinitesimal changes. I'm just trying to lead you to um, a final answer that's sort of an average kind of thing. Um, now, from the ideal gas law, I know Pb equals nRT, which tells me that P is equal to nRT over V. Good so far? I'm going to take this and substitute it here. So this just equals N R T over V delta V is equal to Q. And I'm going to rearrange things. I'm going to say 1 over N R Q over T is equal to delta V over V. Remember when I told you I increased the volume? I increase the entropy. Remember that? One of the things I said, because if I increase the volume of gas, I give the molecules many more ways they can arrange themselves. So this tells me that this corresponds to an increase in entropy, right? Because delta V is positive, this is an increase in entropy. And so this is just a constant. That tells me that this is also then a measure of entropy, the, the heat flow divided by the temperature. So Guys, this is for concept. Uh, we can calculate a few things from this under specific circumstances, but generally this is just a concept. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that concept and I'm going to use it in a case where it actually does work. All right, so I have hot piece of hot, cold piece of cold, and insulated raw, yes. Why did you split the NR from the... I, I, just, I can put it anywhere. I just put it over here because it's just a constant. And it has enough, it's never going to change, so it's not a part of entropy. All right. So here's, here's the thing I'm trying to get you to see. I've got an iron bar connecting two big tanks of water, one at a high temperature and one at a cold temperature. And so how is the heat going to flow? From the hot to the cold. Is any work being done? No, right? There's no work done because there's no volume change. Right? So there's no work being done. Heat is just flowing through. 
does it make sense to you that whatever heat flows out of this is exactly the same amount that flows into this? Because can you see this really long layer of insulation that I wrapped this with that's perfect and doesn't let anything leak through? All right, you get my thing. And so I'm sending, I've got this thing very well insulated, so all the heat is forced to go through the rod. Just like the Bay Bridge, anything that gets on has to get off, right? So whatever amount of heat flows out has to flow into the next tank. So let's take a look at this equation. That saying the amount of heat that flows divided by the temperature is a measure of the entropy. So on this side, the hot side, for a given amount Q, I'm going to get an entropy that's equal to that value divided by the temperature. And that's leaving, isn't it? So I've got a decrease in entropy here that's Q over T hot. And on this side, I've got an increase in entropy because it's raising the temperature, making them buzz faster. And it's also Q, but it's over T cold. No, 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 we haven't have said that yet. So it, it's decrease, the heat's pulling out here, so it's a decrease, and on this side it's pulling in, so it's an increase. All right? Now, are they the same? I said Q was the same, but it's the entropy change the same. Which number is a bigger number? The number that's divided by a big number, or the number that's divided by a small number? So what's happening is, on this side I'm increasing, and this number's bigger than this side where I'm getting decrease. The entropy of the universe increased. Even though there was a decrease on this side, there was a bigger increase on this side because divided by a small number makes a bigger number. And the Q's are the same because of conservation of energy. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Yes? What is the uh, Q of T stand for? That's entropy. So this is basically a measure of entropy. By the way, the symbol for entropy don't ask, I wasn't there when they voted. Yes. Oh, our entropy is increasing when, and so here's the way it works. It's just as easy. If heat flows in, entropy increases. If heat flows out, entropy decreases. Since it's tied to this Q, a positive Q is an increase, a negative Q is a decrease. All right? So this is just a single example, but I, I, and it's a fairly simple one, which is why I choose it, because it doesn't involve any integration. Um, but just even from this, then, we can see that the total entropy of the universe increase in this situation. In a perfect world with no friction, you could design a machine in which the entropy change was zero. Right? Because there's just no way that we can actually get there. But I mean, so even the theoretical best, 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 best is a net change of zero, never a decrease. So you see what I'm saying? Is even in ideal perfect, the best you can get is no change. You can never get a negative change net for the whole process. You can get local negative changes, but that means somewhere in the universe there was a bigger positive change. Right? And this is very much a concept kind of thing, but it's something that you need to understand. Um, so, let me see if there's something else here. Alright. Um, now, I'm going to move into the next, uh, a little further into chapter 13. One of the, I, I, I signed three, like three homework problems out of chapter 13, so it's not a lot, but one of them is going to make you pull your hair out, so I'm giving you a heads up on it right now. It's a really important problem, okay, and it's not, I hate to say that, it's not hard in the sense that it's way over our heads to understand. It's hard, again, that thing, there's a 300 little equations that come buzzing at you like these, all right? So I'm going to kind of talk my way through it, but before I, I'm, in order to work my way there, no, I'll, I'll do it now and then we'll, I'll go back to the other part, this is a little strange here. So here's the way the problem is set up. Okay, I have one cubic meter, I have four uh, cubic meters, and I have 60 kilopascals 
and I have 120 kilopascals. And this represents something we call a heat engine. I'm going to have a gas in, a, in a, some kind of a device, and I'm going to force it to take this path. Before I do the way to set up your homework, I want, I want you to work with me for a second. If I have this as 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and I'm going to take my path around like this, when you look at that, does this engine do work, or do I do work on it? Actually, both are sort of true. But the network, here's how we do this, guys. How much work is done, not how much, is the work done going from 1 to 2 positive or negative? And from 2 to 3? 0, right? Because there's no volume change. And from 3 to 4? Negative. And from 4 to 1? Which one's bigger, 1 to 2 or 3 to 4? No, 1 to 2. This is bigger because I have a bigger pressure. Right? So the area under this line is bigger than the area under this line. So now tell me, in the whole cycle, is positive or negative work done? Positive, because the top one is bigger than the bottom one. If I reversed and went the other way, then I would have negative work here and positive work here. So then if I would have a net negative work done. You go, why would anybody build something like that? And you know why they would? Because it's called a refrigerator. All right? The basic idea of a refrigerator is that you take heat from inside the refrigerator and pump it into an environment that's even higher temperature than the refrigerator is. Now, it turns out, as I told you, that 100% efficiency is the maximum possible and it's not achievable. So here's the deal. Given the fact that nothing can be 100% efficient, if I have a refrigerator and I say, oh, it's a hot day, I'm going to open the refrigerator to cool my room down, what happens? I heat the room. Because the refrigerator has to dump out more heat into the room than it pulls out of the refrigerator. Because it can't be 100% efficient. So it turns out it's generating more heat than the refrigerator is actually cooling. So by opening the door, you make it heat the room rather than cool it. Yeah, should you jump inside, have someone close the door on you, and, and that solves a lot of problems. You also don't have to take tests or anything else. Uh, <laughs> And they put lovely flowers around the little stone that you're um, so, so with this setup then, here's the thing we want to do. We want to take a look at this and say, can you find the work? I'm going to label these A, B, C, and D. So 1 to 2 is path A, 2 to 3 is path B, right? That makes sense? What is the work done by this machine going along path A? And I want a number. Without numbers, what am I plugging into? What's the work done along that path? P delta V. Now what's delta V? Alright, and P? 120,000. That little K in front of the Pascal, nasty. That's the thousand. So this is equal to 360,000 Pascal. I used to not Pascal joules, sorry, I'll look up. Joules. Alright, positive or negative? We already decided, right? Now, what's the work along B? And the work along C? Negative, but specifically negative what? What's half of 36? All right, and then the work along D is zero for total work of what? 180,000 joules. All right, this is how, this is why you call this the heat engine. It's, its sole purpose is to dump heat into your room. All right, or actually we could use this to do any kind of work we want. So if this is running your sewing machine or whatever, I mean, it could be anything that does work. It's positive, meaning it's putting work out. If it were negative, it would mean we'd have to put work in to make it happen, and it would be a refrigerator. I'm sorry, but why is work C uh, half of work A? Because 60 is half of 120. Oh, so it's a different pressure. Okay. okay. No problem. 
No, like I said, there's a million little things. That, yeah. That's why I'm glad you asked, because otherwise they fly past. All right, so, so far, so good. Now, could I find the temperature if I tell you that there's one mole of ideal gas in this thing? Could I find the temperature out each of these corners? Right? I could find this, here just use the ideal gas law. My P is 120,000, my B is one cubic meter, my R is 8.314, and N is one. The only thing I don't know, temperature I can find. So I can find the temperature at all three, uh, at all four of these points. Before I do this, guys, let's talk. Where's the coldest temperature on here? Where, um, out of one, two, three, four, which one of them is the coldest? Everybody sees that? Which one is the hottest? Two. And which one's next? Hot? Three. So it goes cold, a little warmer, warmer, warmest. Right? Everybody sees that okay? One and three are the same? No. I say it goes from here to here to here. The reason they're not the same is because this is 120 times 1, and this is 3 times 60, so it's not the same. This is going to give me 180, which is hotter than 120. Right? So, yeah. They, in this case, with the numbers, we can see they're not the same temperature. So you can go through and you can calculate all these temperatures. Um, and the fun part about this is, is I did it, and I did bring my paper that has the temperatures on, and then whatever. All right, so um, here's the thing then. Once I go through and I find all those temperatures, um, can I find delta U, can I find U? Can I find U at each of these points? So I can find the temperature here, here, here. Can I find U? Right, because it's equal to what? Three halves NKT, or NRT, I mean. And I know N, one mole R, I know, and I just found all the T's, so I can find the, I can find the energy associated at one, two, three, and four. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, can I find the change in energy going from one to two? I've got the energies of one and two, so clearly I can. I can find U, delta U along A, I just basically take the two energies and subtract them final and minus the initial. Going from here to here, is delta U positive or negative? Positive. And going from here to here? Negative. And going from here to here? Negative. And going from here to here? Positive. Everybody see that okay? Now, I've got work for each leg of the path. I've got delta U for each leg of the path. Do I have enough information to find Q? Right? I do from the first law. So delta U is equal to Q minus W. And so I have everything I need to find this. Now, if I do that, I can find, I have enough information now not only to find what the total output of the engine is, which you've already found, but I can also find the efficiency. And uh, on this one, the, the efficiency is something we haven't talked about yet. So it turns out the good news is it makes total sense. In words, not just in this class, and any time we're talking efficiency, what is the notion of efficiency? What does it mean to say how efficient something is? For how good it works, but let's put it a little more mathematical. So let's say another way you might read it's bang for buck, right? It's how much bang for buck, and it's how much do you get out of what you put into it. So if I'm gonna spend $100 on a stereo, I want the best stereo I can get for $100, so that's more efficient. But at some sense, you realize that you're never going to get a stereo in which the parts involved cost $100, right? Because there's always some, you know, somebody to work on it, and they want to make a profit, and well, so you're never going to get 100% efficiency on something unless you build it yourself, and even then you're going to have to buy your parts. So the idea of efficiency is how much do you get out for how much you put in? Does that make sense? So that's what efficiency is. In my engine that I've got there, what is the, what represents the energy that I ended up putting into it? I mean, in other words, what's actually, uh, uh, how do I put it? Yeah, I, I mean, what, what's the energy that actually goes into this thing? But no, I mean, so, first off, what, work is not an energy I put in, right? Work is not an energy, work is what I'm getting out. Work is what I want. So efficiency is clearly going to be how much work do you, are you going to get, but how much energy did you put into it? So here's the thing I want to look. If I look at this going from here to here, you told me work was positive, right? 
You also told me, well, maybe you didn't. I told me, if I go along here, work is positive, but you also know that Q is positive because why? Because the temperature increased. So here's the thing. I know Q is positive. First off, I know delta U is positive. And I know that W is positive, but I subtract it, so Q has to be bigger than W. That means heat flowed in, right? Heat, heat flowed, flowed in. Then, when I come here, is any work being done? No, but the temperature decreased, so Q is negative, and I don't want that. I mean, that's not energy in, that's energy out. So I only want what's, what I'm putting into it. So what happens is I go through all this, and I find out the QH, or the Q that flows in, is the, the um, energy that I put into it. The energy that flows out is lost. I don't count that. That's not part of my efficiency. So I put it in, and some comes back, but not all of it, and some work gets done. So I'm the one who supplies all the energy that goes into it. I'm the one who uses the work that comes out. And anything that it dumped out, I don't care about, because I only cared about how much work it put out. We do it this way. We write this as QH, meaning high temperature, that means anytime we write QH, that means heat that flows in, because it flows from hot to cold. If I write QC, that means heat that flows out. So the H says hot, that means heat's flowing from hot in. So QH is a way we represent heat that flows in, if it were some energy from the outside from a hotter source flowed in. And this is what gives me my efficiency. Now, from a pure, pure conservation of energy, what happens is, QH is the energy I put in, work is what I get out, and QC is what comes out that I can't use, right? Does it make sense that QH has to equal W plus QC? This is what I put in, I get some work out, and I get some heat lost. So to keep balance, this is what has to happen. That means that W is equal to QH minus QC. So another way to write this is QH minus QC all over QH. Now, this can be proved, but it takes lots of calculus. And we're not going to do it. Even though I know a lot of you can follow it, it's part of time constraint. It's actually not difficult, but we haven't actually developed the calculus rule for adiabats, where, for anybody who cares, basically we have to derive this law, and it's fairly straightforward using calculus, but we're going to just punchline to it because it's a long derivation. In the most efficient possible, or we're assuming that there's no friction, there's no nothing that steals anything from you, this is the maximum efficiency that you can get. All right, it actually, we can just replace the T, the Q's with T's, where that's actually a temperature. All right, so then this goes on, gives me one, we come here. This is the maximum possible that I can get. An efficiency one means you get everything out that you put in. Looking at this equation, what would have to be true in order for the maximum efficiency to equal one? This term has to be zero, right? There's two ways that can happen. It can happen if Tc is zero, and it can happen if Th is infinity. Neither of those are happening. This one doesn't happen because an infinite temperature would take an infinite amount of energy and that's not available. This can't happen because of the very same idea. Remember I told you what the uh, third law of thermodynamics was? It's impossible to reach absolute zero. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, it makes sense. The only way you can cool something is to give it something colder so the heat flows out. But there's nothing colder than absolute zero, so you can never get it down to that last bit because there's never any other place for it to flow to that's colder than it is. So you can't get there. All right? So this is your maximum possible efficiency. So if I'm driving my car, what do the TC and TH represent? In other words, it's basically, I'm driving my car, TH is the temperature of my engine. TC is the temperature of the atmosphere around me. This is why we need to keep engines cool. That's why you have to have that radiator to keep blowing cold air in, because if the engine just kept heating up itself, you wouldn't have a big enough temperature difference and you burn more gasoline trying to get stuff done. So this is why you, you need a radiator, you need that fan to keep air circulating in there. And believe it or not, once you get it going, your car works better on a cold day than on a hot day. 
But you all know that. If you go up the canyon on a hot day, you see people overheating their engines all the time, right? Uh, because they're not very efficient, and all that thermal energy is going into heating the engine rather than heating, I mean, than driving the car. So on a cold day, you get slightly better stuff. So we have this efficiency. Let's come back to here. Um, using this definition, I can calculate Q along each of these paths, right? Because I know delta U and W for each of those paths, so I can find Q for each of those paths. Anything that goes in is QH. Anything that comes out is QC. So wherever you have them, you're going to have positive and negative values, right? And the positive ones are QHs and the negatives are QCs. You put them in to this equation, add up to the QHs, add up to QCs, do this, and you can find the efficiency of that engine. And that's one of your homework questions, to find the efficiency. Because it's not hard. When you do this step by step, the only thing that makes this hard is it's long. It's long. But we're clear on what the, what the work is, right? The work along each path is really straightforward. We wrote it down there. It's easy to find the temperatures using an ideal gas law. Once I find the temperatures, I find u sub a, I mean, excuse me, delta, delta u sub a is just equal to u2 minus u1, right? The, the internal energy here, my internal energy here, is the change in the internal energy. And that's going to be the final one, u2 minus u1, and it's going to equal this. And I get this from what? How do I get this? We know the temperatures at each corner, so u1 is 3 halves nRT1, u2 is 3 halves nRT2. Really straightforward. That's why we find those four temperatures first. We find each of those, each of those internal energies for each of those corners. And when I do this, I, I have my delta U for each path. Once I have W and delta U for each thing, I can find Q simply by doing this. Yeah? Are you taking support W on? Alright, so if, again what you have to read is so if they say how much work is done on the gas then you have to put minus. If they say how much work does the gas do, then you put positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to read the question really carefully. Right, so like, that's why it's really best if we say um, N and Y to remind me. So if they're not saying the gas is doing the work, then they're just gonna have the opposite sign. But when you go down to the last part, you can use it exactly the way that I'm setting it up. All right, so you're gonna get on each path here, you're going to be able to find what Q is. Anytime Q comes up positive, it's QH. And so however many positives you had, you add together to get the total QH. However many negatives you have, you add together to get the total QC. And then that goes into this equation to find the efficiency. And just to give you a guideline, because I won't see you until Monday, um, I got around 18.2% efficiency, uh, percent or 0.182 efficiency, all right? And you might have different numbers on yours, but it's, it's going to be really low efficiency, which is typical. All right? So that's uh, the main thing I want you to understand. It's a very typical thing to not get a very high efficiency. Human bodies, we eat food, whatever, our efficiency range is around 20%. Cars are around 23, 25% efficient. So a lot of, and this is considered good. My, the joke in the, back in the day when I was a kid is, um, my dad used to say, talk about power cars and said they can pass anything but a gas station. Um, think about it, it's a joke. Uh, you can pass anything but a gas station. You can't pass the gas station, you've got to stop and fill up. All right, so because they were, they were terrible efficiency and they had like 30 gallon tanks and you had to stop and fill up all the time because eight miles to the gallon was common. That also meant you could hit 150, no problem. All right, but. We decide that's not a good idea. All right, so I'm going to run away from that problem, uh, and I want to go back and um, actually I have to kind of talk my way through, through this as well. So um, the basic idea of, uh, of a heat engine goes as follows. You imagine you have some sort of a heat reservoir that's at a high temperature pH. Imagine you have some sort of a heat reservoir that's a cold temperature QC, and you put whatever engine you've got here, and 
The way it works is this. Heat flows from the QH into your, whatever your heat engine is going to be. It outputs some work, and then it dumps the extra heat down into QC. Because you can only make heat flow if it goes from hot to cold. So basically, this is the idea of the engine. Now, we've got a lot of laws that we've said, but one of them is there is no engine that can 